Uh, welcome to Aviation Maintenance Planning. Looking now at the relationship between part M and part 145. Interface and responsibilities. Remembering that within the organisation, we may in fact have our own maintenance guys. We may have an we may be an operator with our own uh, maintenance organisation, or we may be an operator only and to outsource our maintenance organisation, or we may be a hybrid. We may have line maintenance, and we do line maintenance, defer rectification, and for heavy maintenance, for bigger checks, we take the aeroplane somewhere else. Why would we do that? Because it's very cost effective. Think about the uh, facility that you need if you're going to do heavy maintenance. Think about the, uh, the manpower and so on. And think about how many aircraft you're going to have. So it's all again about capacity planning. If I have a hangar, and hangars are expensive, I want to use that hangar as much as I possibly can. So imagine I use that hangar five days a week. Imagine I only have a day shift, and many companies operate a hangar like this. So we're using our expensive resource, we're using it for 40 hours a week. Basically a quarter of the week. We don't use it the weekends, and we don't use it for the evenings and the nights. So uh, whether that's the most economic use of the resource, we have to decide. But it's, uh, it's a challenge to get the balance right. Uh, I know, for example, of several organizations, and they operate, they call, it's a new terminology that they've created called an FBO. You know this term, FBO, fixed base operation, and supporting business jets. And they also have, for example, a hangar, and they make more money off the FBO than they do from, from the hangar. Why? because the realization of the potential. A hangar could operate quite easy for two shifts each day. Forget about the night shift. Night shifts are not very productive. Consider the day shift. We could have an early shift and a late shift operating maybe six days a week. So if we do that, we'd be using it for maybe a hundred hours a week. So a lot more efficient. However, you've got to have the work to support the labour. If you don't, if it does not work like that, then in actual fact it's m far more cost effective to have a line maintenance crew to support the uh, defects on the aircraft together with a external resource for the base maintenance. An operator is required to have a process to manage continuing airworthiness. We spoke about this as a direct responsibility. Moreover, it's required. In fact, you will not get approval as an operator unless you have uh, a 145 organisation that you can demonstrate to the regulator looking after your aeroplanes. You don't need to have base maintenance. You can organise base maintenance on an ad hoc basis. And I went to a presentation, for example, and there are 27 different locations that you can get a C check in the European area that we are now, including Eastern and Western Europe. 27 places. So, what does that tell you? It's a buyer's market. It's very much uh, to the advantage, if you like, of the operator because they have so much choice. Or to contract a 145 organisation to cover at least the requirement of both line maintenance and minor maintenance. And that is what the regulator will want to see. That at least you have cover for mine, uh, line maintenance and for uh, regular uh, minor maintenance. So, whilst the maintainer is responsible to sign the CRS for all maintenance, it's ultimately the responsibility of the operator, and we've said this a few times already, uh, through the Part M organisation to ensure that the required maintenance requirements have been met. 
which is one of the reasons why we talk about the obligation of the Part M organisation during the maintenance. We have to confirm that the maintenance has been performed in accordance with the requirements. There are a number of areas where there is an overlap of responsibility between the Part M organisation and the Part 145 organisation. What we mean by overlap is where they are involved in the same area of the business. For example, in the area of mandatory reporting, uh, compliance with AMC 20-8, and it's very easy to find these documents now thanks to uh, the internet and, and good old Google. If you just put AMC 20-8 into Google, up it pops straight away and you can see exactly the document we're talking about. A control procedure to provide guidance on how mandatory reporting will be achieved. It's a requirement for both Part M and 145 organisations to deliver electrical wiring system training, electrical wiring interconnect system. Uh, we'll talk about what's involved with this uh, when we get into uh, a different module. Uh, and fuel tank safety training, of course. And so both of these areas are very important, particularly on uh, wide-bodied aircraft and it's again down to inspection standards but there are uh, there is a need for an industry understanding again during inspection particularly in the case of electrical wiring so if I was to ask a question and I think maybe this will surprise you and the question is during the year 2010 from January to December 2010, in America, during flight, there was a number of incidents where there was either smoke and fire, or smoke or fire, on board an aeroplane during flight. So one year, only North America, on board smoke and fire incidents. So uh, let me ask Petter, how, how many do you think there were? How many incidents in one year? Have a guess. 300. 300. Would you say more or, or less, Mike? More because of the law of wages. You say more? Yes. Please. How many more? Maybe 350. 350. 350. Maria, what would you say? Maybe 100. Maybe 100. There was 1,200 smoke and fire events on board an aeroplane during commercial operations in one year in North America. Why is it not on the news? Why do we not hear about it? Because it doesn't result in an aeroplane crashing. It doesn't result in people dying. It's just something that happens on the aeroplane. And it's dealt with. But it's a serious issue. And again, it's down to inspection standards and it's down to managing the wiring. One of the worst events ever concerned with wiring happened on a 747 in the 90, uh, early 1980s, mid 1980s, mid 1980s. And what happened was the wiring for the forward cargo door shorted out and powered up the cargo door latch actuators. And the latch is opened, yeah. the cargo door burst open, ripped off the aeroplane, took a section of the skin off the fuselage and there was nine passengers sitting there on the 747 and they went straight out the side of the aeroplane, never to be seen again. They never saw these guys. They, just, they were still sitting on the chairs. Still sitting on the chairs, and now you're out, outside the aeroplane. Wiring, inspection. Again, how many times to keep mentioning the same thing, but it's so important. Whilst each has a specific responsibility to deliver the training to all applicable staff, we're talking about the organisations, means the, the Part M organisation and the 145 organisation. The Part M organisation also has oversight of the effective compliance of the Part 145 organisation. So it works like this. The 145 organisation does the maintenance and is responsible for itself. It issues a certificate of release to service. 
The Part M organisation is responsible for itself and its compliance with all the requirements and it's also responsible for the oversight of the 145. Means, before I will let you work on my aeroplane, I need to satisfy myself that you are fully competent. And I've had conversations with uh, organisations and they said, why do I need to check this organisation out? It's 145 approved. I said, okay. I said, but what does that 145 approval mean? It means that they can do so and so, so and so, so and so. Yes, absolutely. And what in terms of validity of the approval? How do you maintain a 145 approval? And the answer is that once you've been issued with an approval, it never expires. You are required to self-maintain your approval. Now, some countries, they have an annual renewal of the approval. These are outside Europe. So, what happens in your country? Do you have a, an annual? Three years. Three years, okay. There's an example, three years. Uh, I know of countries where every one year, the regulator will audit a 145 and will renew the approval. And so, you have to prove yourself every one year. It doesn't work like that in EASA. In EASA, once you've got the approval, you will maintain the approval. The regulator will oversee you. But, it's not the same thing. So, what happens to a 145? Well, you start your business, and everything's okay, and then somebody else starts another business up the road, and they pay a little bit more money, and they take your best people. And so, you need to recruit some more people. So, what's happened now, several years on, there is a skill dilution. So, your competency has now dropped down because you've lost several of your key people. Does that reflect in your 145? No, of course not. The only way you can understand it is by looking at the 145 and say to the 145, please show me how you're managing your ongoing processes. Please show me your staffing levels. Please show me your competence uh, assessment process for your people. Please show me how you're managing your people. Please show me your training. Show me how you're managing your training. This is how we know that a company is okay. And there is a whole variability out there. Are some companies better than others? Of course, it's normal. It's, this is what we find in the business place. So, in terms of trying to get maintenance for my aircraft, which company will I choose? Well, I, I won't choose the most expensive company, but I won't choose the cheapest either. I will choose the one that gives me the best product for the best price. So I'm going to look somewhere, it will be above the cheapest one. But I will be focusing very strongly on the standards within the 145 and the management of the standards.